I was just letting him finish. We're good. Don't get stressed. I'm fixing to do it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're proud to have fill our pulpit this morning from Petra Ministries, Dr. Zach Perry. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. No, that's just my notes. I'm not going to say anything important anymore. Well, good morning, everybody. I am Zach. I think we all know each other. My wife and I, Aaron, do the, uh, the kids' ministry here at church. And uh, we're very privileged to do that, to get to spend uh, weekends with your kids and your grandkids. It's an honor and a privilege. And uh, this morning, I have the privilege of bringing a message. So hopefully it's, it's something that um, everybody in this room can take something home away from them, with them today. Everybody from the youngest to the oldest, I hope that I, I bring something to each of you. Um, go ahead and turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 15, please. Luke 15, verse 1. While you're doing that, uh, I'll kind of let you know how I do things in Petra. I've developed a little format that it's probably not original to me, um, but it's just what I do, and that is about every third statement that I'm going to make, I'll frame it as a question, right? So I could say, Jesus loves you, Jesus died for you, and he died so that you could be with him in heaven. But to keep everybody's attention, I'll switch it up at the end, and I'll say, Jesus loves you, Jesus died for you, and he died so that you could be with him where? And it just kind of flips the brain around. It wakes you up and makes you think. Um, it keeps the kids engaged because we've got kindergarten through fifth grade back there on Sundays, and I'm sure you guys understand it's hard sometimes to keep that age group engaged. Another thing I do in that is as I'm talking, I'm, I'm scanning the room, I'm, I'm trying to make eye contact with kids and making sure that they are engaged. And if one of them appears to be zoning off, um, when it comes time to throw that question out there, I'll pose it directly to them. So I'll make a state, Jesus loves you, Jesus died for you, and he died so he could, you could be with him where, Ashley? And if Ashley's zoning out, she wakes up. But here's what happens in a room full of of students. When you ask one student a specific question, everybody else in the room automatically thinks they know the answer, and they're all in, and they're all engaged. So I'm telling you that uh, to say that some of that's going to flow out in here today. Um, If I call on you, I'm not picking on you. It's just I caught you checking your email or whatever you're doing. So uh, try to stay with me because it's going to be a statement, statement, question, right? Statement, statement, question. Does that work for you, Bobby? See, it's already working. All right, Luke 15, verse 1. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Or, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she will call her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here safely. Uh, Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us this morning. And and I pray that this word would would fall on, on good soil this morning, Lord. And uh, we pray this all in your son's Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to talk this morning about the idea of God's economy. Um, More specifically, where do you fall into God's economy? What is your value in God's economy? See, in this world, we we have economy. And I think we all understand that in this room. Even the Petra kids understand what makes a dollar worth a dollar. What makes a gallon of milk worth $4? It's, it's all economy. Everything has a value. But God's system places value in a different way. God's economy is different than the world's economy, and I think it's important for all of us to understand that. So we're going to look at that today. Um, our, uh, our first illustration this morning is going to be talking about how God provides for us. And uh, we're going to have a little fun with this in just a second. You see, 
God will take what you have and make it what you need. God will take what's in your hand, and it may not be enough, probably never enough, but he'll make it what you need. See, God knows that the best thing for each of us is to depend on him for everything. If you're here this morning and you have a good job and you depend on that job, your world can get ruined tomorrow morning when you get to work and find out you're no longer welcome there, right? If you're here this morning and you're doing really, really good in school and you're depending on that to be your, your livelihood, you think that you're going to graduate with this big degree and that's going to fix all your problems, I got news for you. That's not going to fix all our problems. God knows that the best thing for us is to depend on him, right? And the good thing about that is he is always willing and always able and more than able to provide for us. Um, in Luke 6.38, it says, give and you will receive. Philippians 4.19 says that God will supply all your needs. Deuteronomy 28.12 says that the Lord will send rain at the right time for his, from his rich treasury in heaven, and it will bless the work that you do. So, since this is kind of a Petra vibe this morning, we've got an illustration set up here, and I think now's a great time to get into it. So, I'm going to need one volunteer. Anybody. It could be a kid or a kid at heart. Anybody besides my own kid want to volunteer? Anybody? I'm going to start calling names. You want to? Come on, Leva. Come on up. Look at this. Can we give her a hand? How are you this morning? Fine. Good. Come right over here with me. We're going to do a magic trick. We are going to talk for just a minute about snow, right? Because it's July 5th. We're in southeast Texas. What else would be on our minds than snow? All right, and uh, we're going to do a little, but this is magic snow. Some of you, uh, some of you younger kids, when I say snow, you're, you're, I've heard that before. I don't remember what it is. It's the thing that happened one time when your parents made you wake up before the sun and made you play in it for two hours until you were miserable. Do you all remember that? I know my kids do. I, I probably could have brought a picture of them miserable in the snow. All right, but this is magic snow. Will you go ahead and hold up that white cup in the middle there? That right there is our magic snow. And, of course, if we've got snow, we want to make snowballs or uh, have a snowball fight or make a snowman or something like that. Um, will you just go ahead and pour it into the bucket there? Thank you so much. Look at that. Um, it's not really enough, right? I mean, it's kind of loose anyway, but even if it was sticky, that's not enough for a snowball fight. You guys with me? But God will take what you have and make it what you need. Pastor Philip is fond of this scripture. It's Malachi 3.10, where he says, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't even have room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. God will take what you have and make it what you need. You can go ahead and pour that water until it's uh, about issues full. Just pour it in there. Don't be shy. Fast. Pour it in there fast. Go ahead. Get it in there. God will take what you have in your hand, and the circumstances you're in may not make sense, and it may not seem like it's enough, but what will happen is it will become more than you need. Snowball fight, anybody? It's snow. No, it's magic. So simply put, God can take a handful of powder and make a winter wonderland for you. Is that cool or what? Let's give Leela a hand, please. Thank you so much. I'm grateful for her being willing to participate and also that she didn't try to throw anything at Michelle. That was very mature of you, Miss Leela. So in God's... Yes, don't let it melt on the carpet. And if you guys are wondering, that's the stuff they put in diapers. Uh, I probably should have told you that first. It's not used, though. It's new. In God's economy, what you have is not enough, but it's more than you need. Right? So... That makes sense to me um, in an in a economic, mathematical kind of way, right? If I need five and I only have one and God gives me four, I have what I need, right? We're talking simple math here, right, Petra? If I need five and I have one and God gives me five or six, I have more than I need. Simple. But the stories that Jesus told, the economics of it don't make a lot of sense. I mean, it just really makes no sense to me at all. Now, the first story... It's about a shepherd and um, his sheep. That's lamb chops. 
You guys know that though, right? Raise your hand if you know lamb chops. You pet your kids on them. Yeah, see? Yeah. Petra doesn't know, but this, this, so this is for the adults. <laughs> Jesus told a story about a shepherd that had 100 sheep. Now, instantly, when he began to tell the story to the people gathered around, their mindset went economics. They understood in that day and time that those 100 sheep were that young man's livelihood. He depended on those. Those were his own personal economy. And he tells the story of how one day the man counts his 100 sheep and comes up short. One of his sheep was missing. Okay? So, what does he do? He leaves 99 sheep in the wilderness and goes looking for one sheep. Now, the people sitting around probably gasped when they heard this. If nothing else said something to their neighbor beside them, like, what is he talking about? Do the math, guys. You've got 100 sheep, there's 99, and there's one, and you're going to go looking for the one and abandon 99 momentarily? But there's danger. There's danger, right? If, if you find the one lost sheep, whoopee do, the wolves came and ravaged the flock. This makes no sense in our economy. This doesn't add up mathematically. But in God's economy things are different. In God's economy, values are placed where we don't necessarily expect them. So as Jesus, the master storyteller, was telling this story, I think it's easy for us to understand that the sheep represent us, right? The sheep are us. I'll volunteer myself to be the wayward uh, because I have those tendencies. And Jesus, the good shepherd, represented the shepherd in this story. So we have to understand that there's a point he's trying to illustrate, and it's important See, the, the point that he's making here is that even one sheep has more value than we can understand to God. Genesis 1, 27 tells us that we are made in God's image. Suddenly, our value begins to, begins to shift. We, we now see that we're getting our value from something other than ourselves, right? We are made in God's image. Therefore, we must be valuable to God if we are his image bearers. Now, sometimes people get confused when you start talking about how we, humankind, mankind, are made in the image and likeness of God. It kind of gets confusing, and especially to, to the Petra age group. It's sometimes hard to explain because, I mean, if you think about it, if we look around the room today, we're all pretty average people, and yet I'm looking and... I just, I don't see anybody that could pass as my stunt double. We've got a room full of people, and nobody here really looks like me, right? I mean, me and Pastor Philip, we have the same haircut, but nobody's going to confuse me for him because he's 10 feet taller than I am, right? So what does it mean that we are the image bearers of God? If we all look different, if we all have our own unique humanness, what does that mean? Well, it means that God created each of us to reflect his glory to creation, Hear me on this. Notice I said to creation. I didn't say he created us to be good Christians and live a good example so that other people could see how to live a good Christian life. That's good. That's good. But that's not what we're talking about here because all people are made in the image and likeness of God. All people are God's image bearers, and our purpose is to reflect God's glory here on this earth. Right? Um, This is an example that I use in Petra, some pictures I'm going to show you guys, uh, to kind of help explain the image thing. Who can tell me what this is? And we shout in Petra, so just shout it out. That's right. That's right. Actually, you were second, but good job. That's the Washington Monument. And, and whom does it memorialize? George Washington, right? It's there for a purpose, and its purpose is to remind us of the great leader he was for this country, right? On the battlefield and the presidency. He was important on this holiday weekend. George Washington was important to America, right? That tower is built to memorialize him, and worldwide people see that and know who George Washington is. Let's look at the next picture. There's one problem with this tower. One problem. Can anybody guess what the problem is? Dom? Concrete's falling off. That's true. (laughs) That's not the problem. It's simple, and uh, we're we're not going to worry about the picture because you guys already, you guys all have a dollar bill in your wallet, I'm sure. That tower looks nothing 
like George Washington. Right? That tower is there for a purpose. It was built for a purpose, and it carries out its purpose well. But it looks nothing like George Washington. John 4, 24 says that God is spirit. We are human. We, are, we have spirit in us, but God is Holy Spirit, right? Holy as in completely, completely spirit. We are here as image bearers of God, and we all don't have to look the same because we don't look like God. We reflect God's glory. We were created with a purpose, guys. Check this out. You were created to love, worship, and enjoy your creator. You were created by your creator to love, worship, and enjoy your creator. And all of that is not for our creator, but it's for us. To love and be loved by your creator. To surrender and worship. You guys know when you surrender and worship. I mean, yes, you're worshiping God, but it's, you get so much out of it, right? To enjoy and be enjoyed by your creator. That's what we were made for, but that's all just a gift for us. We were created to reflect God's image to glory. So, knowing that, if we are purposefully image bearers of God, then it stands to reason that one person, myself or anybody else included, must be infinitely valuable to God. Does that make sense? Infinitely valuable to God. So if one is infinitely valuable and all are infinitely valuable, then in God's economy... He'll abandon everything to find one lost sheep. Think about that, guys. So, okay, we're we're, we're putting some sense into it. But then, the story goes on. And uh, he tells a story about a lady who has ten coins and loses one and gets kind of crazy about it, right? Now, that I can understand, right? Right? Because if I have ten bills, and that's apparently all she had, and then that's all I have, it really doesn't matter to me the denomination of the bill. If I've got ten tens or ten hundred dollar bills in the bank, if that's all I have and one goes missing, it's time out. Let's find out where that missing one is. Because that's my own personal little economy, and ten percent of everything I have is a lot. I don't care who you are in this room. Ten percent of everything you have is a lot. So what happens to this lady? She looks up and realizes she's missing ten percent of her little economy, and she goes into finding mode, right? Jesus tells the story that, that she would light a lamp to get the house lit and get out the broom and dustpan and get to work, right? She was seeking to find this coin, and she was determined to find it. Um, for my first several years of marriage, I had the privilege of living with my in-laws with the Corleys. And um, if, uh, if you guys don't know this, there's something about my mother-in-law, and that is that she is, um, boy, when she cleans, like, it gets clean, right? Like, she cleans kitchen top to bottom. Me, um, I might say at the house, I might say to my wife, I might say, hey, baby, I'm going to go clean the kitchen. And then what I would do is go put dishes in the dishwasher and get that started, and uh, I would wipe off the counters and the table and maybe sweep the floor and take out the trash, and there you go, kitchen clean, I'm done, 10 minutes, boom, Right? That is not how Miss Mona cleans the kitchen, right? She, she wisely starts at the top, and by the top, I mean above the cabinets, and starts cleaning. And, of course, that's smart because all the dirt and dust that's gathered up there just falls down, and she works her way down, and the dirt's running from her, but she always gets it, right? She always gets her man, which in this case is the dirty kitchen. There were many times where I would come home and walk into the front door and kind of wipe my feet, and there would be my father-in-law, and he'd, you better take them shoes off, boy. I'm like, no, Dad, they're, my, my shoes are clean. It's fine. And he'd just say, they're not clean enough. <laughs> okay. So off they would come. Got my shoes in my hand. I tiptoe through the kitchen, and there'd be dear old mom-in-law, like down by the baseboard with probably like a toothbrush. Because, you know, sometimes you've got to get a toothbrush to get the little cracks. And she's, oh, hey, honey, and th- there she go. That's what, that's what Jesus is talking about right here. This woman is cleaning with a vengeance. Like, she's going to search and search and search and not stop because... For whatever reason, the value of this coin to her is the most important thing to her at this moment, right? Now, I have here, uh, I have here ten coins. I thought I'd do a uh, a little demonstration for you guys, just to kind of, you know, it's for the kids. So, ten gold uh, 
Jake and the Neverland Pirate Coins. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh. <laughs> <Hang on. laughs> Better count them good, right? All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well, that's fitting, huh? Okay. I had an illustration with ten coins, but we'll, I guess we'll skip that for a minute. Um, you guys are going to have to cut me some slack. It's my first time teaching. Uh, kind of nervous. I, uh, I, I'll tell you what. If y'all, just for a second, if y'all could bear with me, I'm going to see if I can see if I can find this coin real quick. Cause I, I know it's, eh, I had it this morning. It's got to be down here somewhere. I'm just, uh, I know it's in here. Hang on a second. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with me on that. You know this is important. I needed it. I found it. That's exactly what the lady in this story did, right? She, she put everything else aside, even a whole group of people that's here to watch me talk. She put everything aside because the value of this coin was serious to her. It was big time valuable to her, right? So she finds it. She gets excited. And she calls all her friends, and she calls all her neighbors, and she says, come over. I'm throwing a party because I found 10% of what I own, so come join me. I'll pay for the pizza. Here, there's a 20 spot. Get some pizza. We're having a party. What? Wait a minute. Wait, just a minute ago, finding that 10% was so important to her that nothing else mattered. And yet, when she found it, the value of the money seems to just fly out the window. She's willing to call everybody over and have a party, and guys, parties aren't free. What does this mean? The value... The value is not monetary. Your value is not who you are or what you do how hard you work at your job or how good your grades are in school, your value is in the joy you bring the one who seeks you. Right? Let me find my notes. Hang on a second. I'm going to start making stuff up up here. In God's economy, your value is in the joy of the one who seeks you. In God's economy, you are infinitely valuable to God because you are his image bearer. But listen to what Jesus did. Like I said earlier, he's a masterful storyteller. As he, as he comes to the end of the story of this woman seeking a coin, he says in uh, 15, Luke 15, verse 10, In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Did y'all hear what he just did? Let's, one more time. Listen with me, guys. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. You see, all throughout the Bible, we hear of God sitting on his throne, and the angels are in God's presence, singing holy, holy, holy. The angels are in God's presence. But Jesus said there's joy in the presence of the angels. Well, who is in the presence of the angels but the Father? And he sits on the throne, and the angels are singing holy, holy, holy. And God says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Holy Spirit's doing his work again. Son, come see. We're going to cash another check on your blood, Jesus. The Holy Spirit's doing his work. And with great joy, the Father himself rejoices when another coin comes home. Right? In God's economy, you are infinitely valuable to your Creator. And your worth is not in who you are or what you do, but in the joy you bring to the one who seeks you. Sometimes, though, this is all good and happy. Sometimes it doesn't seem like that, right? Excuse me. Sometimes, you know, we, we talk to God as Father. 
Sometimes things don't make sense in our economy, be it financial or emotional. And you just want to look up to heaven and say, Dad, what are you doing? I did all the right things. I played by the rules. Dad, what are you doing? I remember um, one time uh, when I was a young man, about 12 years old, I got the opportunity to go on a, a hunting trip with my father. Of course, we did a lot of hunting trips. But this one was special to me. It was a, a turkey hunt sponsored by Texas Parks and Wildlife. It was a wild turkey hunt here in Texas. And uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't just go buy a ticket to the turkey hunt. You, they, it was like a lottery type thing where you had to go wait in line to get one. And we eventually got tickets to go. Or we got two tags. And uh, we got to go when the day came. We got to load up in the El Camino and head out to the panhandle of Texas. And a uh, good little four-day trip with me, just me and Dad. Sleeping bags and Coleman stoves. It's a good time. When we got there, we set up camp that first evening, and uh, it was still pretty light. So Dad said, hey, let's go out and kind of survey some of the fields, see if we can find a good spot. So we drove down the little dirt road that ran, ran east and west. We drove west and parked right on the side of the road and got out and walked through the ditch and through a little patch of woods that wasn't more than 40 feet deep. And lo and behold, there's a clearing like a little miniature valley, just maybe a couple hundred yards across and then more woods on the other side. That's the first place we went to. And uh, Dad said, you know, this actually, it's west, east, this actually looks like a, a pretty good spot for a turkey hunt. So we went on and looked at some other stuff and went back to camp. Well, then that morning, the next morning, we got up really early, like you do when you're hunting. We went out, we hunted all morning, nothing to show for it. Came back, got a meal, went out, hunted all afternoon, which was ridiculous, but there was nothing to show for it. And again in the evening, hunted till it was dark, nothing to show for it. On the third day, we got up again. Same story. Hunted all morning, hunted all afternoon, hunted until it was dark at night. We've got nothing to show for this, right? So the plan was then, on this fourth day, we'd wake up in the morning, break camp, and make the long drive back from the panhandle. But Dad said that night, he said, hey, let's, let's get up extra early one more time. Let's go one more hunt. And, of course, I'm 12 years old. Yes, okay, let's do this. So that morning, we got up, and we went right back to that same patch of woods, the first one we went to. We parked the El Camino on the road way before the sun came up. And we walked down through that little patch of woods. And we got there. Dad said, okay, you stay here. I'm going to go a little bit over that way. You shoot this way. Don't shoot that way. Right? And we, we had it the whole weekend. He, he had had a, a, a rule set out. And it was simply this. When they come out, we're not going to be together. We're not going to be able to communicate. So you, Zach, you get the big one. You get the biggest tom turkey. And you shoot first. I'll be ready. I'll take whatever's left. And I'll be ready to shoot the second biggest. As soon as your gun goes off, I'll be ready. Because you know when the guns go off, they're going to scatter. So we sit out. The sun begins to come up. It begins to rise in the west. And then you hear it, right? And for you city kids, that's what a turkey sounds like. So here they come. They come rustling out of the woods. The sun's coming up. And they come right into the middle of that little field, right in shotgun range. And right in front of the group, right there playing his day, is without question the big tom turkey right he was definitely bigger than all the other birds he definitely had the longest beard this was the one it was mine right so during this time in my life i was on the 4-8 shooting team i shot competitively now we shot rifles these are shotguns in the hunting story but they're still i had all the breathing technique and all that so when i saw had the bird brought the gun up you know got ready safety off i began to steady my breathing i'm ready Three, two, kadoom! Shotgun blast. My bird falls dead. I haven't shot my gun. I haven't shot my gun. What's going on? So I jump up. Now the birds are scattering. They're running away from the sun. They're running east, uh, west. They're running west. And I'm trying to get, and I can't get a shot off, and they're gone. And before I can even think to be upset by this, my dad comes running through the woods screaming, Come on! Come on! Come on! He runs right past me and straight to the El Camino. Now, I don't know where he's going. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going with him, right? So I run, and I get in the El Camino, and no sooner can I shut the door than he's got it in gear, and we are headed off down the road the same direction as the turkeys because my dad wants to outflank his opponent. We speed down the road a couple of hundred yards. He throws it in park, and he looks at me in the passenger seat. Some of you young men in this room that have been on hunting trips with your dad have seen this look before. It's scary. Uh, it's scary. There's a little bit of an eye twitch, and you can see deep into the eyes that we're not playing anymore. This is real. He looks at me, hesitates for a second, and then he just says, Give me your gun! I did. You already shot your 
Burton. He grabs the gun out of my hand and runs off into the woods, and I'm left in the El Camino screaming, Dad, what are you doing? You see, my dad shot my bird, but knowing that we each were only allowed to shoot one bird, he dropped his gun and got me in the car to go outflank the opponent. But when we got there, he looked at me and determined that I didn't have what it took, and he did. So he took the gun out of my hand. He used my gun instead of his gun because obviously forensic evidence would have determined that he shot two birds with one gun. The turkey CSI were out, right? <laughs> so sometimes you just got to wonder what's going on. There's a third story in this trilogy of parables that Jesus told. And it's a story that we should all know. It's about a father who has two sons. They're a successful farming family. They're wealthy. And one day, the younger of the two sons comes to his father and he says, Dad, I'm ready for my inheritance now. I, uh, essentially, I want you to die so I can have your money. Just give it to me now. Let's get this over with. So the father graciously gives one-third of his wealth to the younger son. And off the younger son goes. And you guys, we all know the story in here. He goes and he blows all his money. And about the time his money runs out, his friends run out on him. And about the time all his friends are gone, the economy crashes. And all of a sudden, he's in a bad place. And he can't find work. And he's, he's looking and he's looking. And finally, he finds a job feeding pigs on a farm. Which, by the way, is a pretty bad job for a Jewish boy. So he's, he's there feeding the pigs one day. And, and Jesus in the story says that he came to his senses. And he said, you know, at my father's house... He's got servants, and they eat three square meals a day. And, and I'm out here drooling over pig slop. My father's house, the servants have quarters, and they have beds to sleep in, and I'm sleeping under the barn, and it smells like pig poop out here. My father's servants have it better than me. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll go back to Dad. I'll say, Dad, I know I'm not worthy to be your son anymore, but can I just be one of your servants? Will you hire me on? I'll work hard, I promise. So he determines that's what he's going to do. And he gets up and he makes the journey home. And Jesus said that while he was still a long ways off, the father saw him. Master storyteller, while he was still a long ways off, the father saw him. Sometimes the good shepherd has to get out and find us and bring us back. Sometimes God will clean and clean and clean and make sure that he can bring us back where we belong. Sometimes the father has to stand patiently waiting hoping. And when he saw his son coming, he forgot about all the traditions of a man of his stature in that day. He broke loose and he ran. He ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and embraced him and said, welcome home. At this point now, the son got out his little note card and began his speech. Father, I've sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father ignores him, just cuts him off right there. He, he ignores what the boy is saying, but with his arm around him, calls to the servants he already has and says, Bring a robe, he's cold. Come put my ring on his finger. Kill the fatted calf and call Taylor Swift's manager. We're going to have a party. He puts the robe around his son. He takes the ring and puts it on his finger and says, Here, son, this ring gives you the permission to spend all the rest of my money. I love you, and I'm glad you're home. Now let's go in the house and party. Time out. I'm going to take a break right here. I'm going to say something that you probably don't expect me to say, that you've probably never heard preached from a pulpit before. But you and me, all of us, we need to try to be a little more like the prodigal son. You see, when we sin, and when we mess up, and we will, and we do, the Father is always ready to forgive us. But look at what happened in this story. Two verses from, Father, can I be your servant, to, they went into the party. The, the prodigal son messed up, and he felt bad about it, but when the father forgave him, he accepted that forgiveness, and he went inside to the party, and he sat at the father's table. We need to do that sometimes. Back to our story. Big Brother is out in the field working, like he always does, always playing by the rules, and he hears the, he hears the music coming from the house, you know, and he calls one of the servants. He's like, hey, what's, what's going on up at dad's house? The servant says, oh, you haven't heard? Your brother came home. Your brother's back and your dad's throwing a party because your brother came back. So the older son, of course, what? So he goes up and he says, Dad, what are you doing? 
How could you do this? I've been here. I've been working hard the whole time. You've never even killed a goat for me and my friends to celebrate with. How could you do all this for him? And the father said, no, no, son. Everything that I have is yours, and you know that. But your brother was gone, and he came back, and that's why we're celebrating. You see, both of the, the boys in this story had the same problem. They both thought that their place at the father's table was earned or unearned by what they did or did not do. But this is not the case. The father in this story built an empire, and on that empire he built a house, and in that house he built a dining room table, and at that table he put chairs and he put places, and his sons belonged at the table. And no matter what they did, good or bad, their place at the table was there because the father put it there for him. In God's economy... You are infinitely valuable to your creator. And in God's economy, your worth is not in who you are or what you do, but in the joy you bring the one who finds you. In God's economy, your place at the table is set, and there's nothing you can do about it. Joel, would you play a little bit while I close this out? Can you do that for me? And make it sound like I know what I'm talking about. There's one more point that I think ties all this together. See, in eternity past, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had a little meeting. And they said, let's create the universe. And in that universe, let's put a planet that's inhabitable and put plants and animals on it. And then then let's put the crown jewel of our creation, mankind, on that planet. See, all three members of the Trinity present and active during creation, right? The Father speaks, the Spirit moves, and Colossians tells us that Jesus is and is continually actively holding creation together, which is really kind of interesting. Father speaks, the Spirit moves, Jesus holds, and it is good. Day one, done. Father speaks, Jesus moves, the Spirit moves, Jesus holds, it is good. On and on we go, until finally, they create the crown jewel. And for the first time, The Father says it is not good, right? It's not good for this person to be alone. Remember, you were created by your Creator. But your Creator is community. Father, Son, and Spirit, eternally together. God is love, the Bible tells us. And and what that means is God's existence in itself is the definition of perfect harmony and perfect unity that cannot be undone. That's what love is. And we don't understand that yet. We will one day. Thank you, Jesus, but not yet. Your creator created you from community for community. So they took a little rib and made a woman, man, woman, together in community. And for the first time, it is no longer good, but now very good. And that's within all of us. That desire for community is real and it's important your value to your creator is unmeasurable and he's created you to be part of a community and just like the shepherd goes and finds the lost sheep picks it up loves on it cares for his wounds and then brings it home to the flock so each of us He'll seek diligently until he finds. And when he does, the first thing he's going to do is bring us into the table. Come, sit, eat. Would you bow your heads with me? If there's anybody here today that um, maybe I'm speaking and you're, you're listening to what I'm saying and you're saying, man, I hear you. I've, um, I've been in church my whole life. But sometimes, even in this very room, I just, I don't feel like I'm part of the community. I feel like what I've done has negated my place at the Father's table. If that's you and you're here today, I'd like to pray with you. Because I want you to know that, that we're all welcome in this room. Every one of us. So, if you're here and you'd like me to pray with you, would you just slip up your hand? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. While we're at it, Maybe you're here and you're hearing some of this stuff for the first time. 
and you're saying, there's, there's a seeker who's seeking me? There's a God who loves me no matter what I've done? I want to know more. I want to be part of this family. And if, if it's the first time and you want to become a Christian, would you trust me just for a minute so I can pray with you? Would you slip up your hand? Anybody in this room? Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can call you Dad. Thank you that, that you're not like our earthly fathers who let circumstances affect their decisions, but you are our perfect Heavenly Father. And no matter what, your love for us cannot be broken. I pray for each of us in this room today that raised our hands, that, that want to come back to the table, that want to feel that, that community again. Lord Jesus, we thank you that, that in your story, it was you, the good shepherd, who went seeking and brought back to the flock. I pray that you'd be with each of us this week as, as we go out of these doors and into, into our normal lives. I pray that you'd send the Holy Spirit with each of us to remind us every day, every second, you love us, you love us, you love us. And Lord Jesus, we pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Well, thank you guys for being here today. Um, I hope you guys all had a great 4th of July weekend. And uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And know this. I can pass this mic around and everybody in this room can stand up and say, right here, I love you. And I mean it. And I know the rest of you mean it too when you say it. It's good to be a part of this family. So you guys have a great weekend.